Women to Watch is an intimate look into the lives of prominent and influential women leaders from around the world and the challenges they faced on their journey. It's the real story behind her title. Join us every week to hear more stories about women from around the world and in your own communities at womentowatch.net. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. For the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC <laughs> Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another week of Women to Watch. I'm Sue Rocco. It's so great to be back here um, with another inspirational woman um, and full of wonderful segments from our watch team as well. Joining me in just a moment will be Alexandra. She goes by Alex Allred, who is a author. She is a teacher. Um, she is a former national athlete in bobsledding, and um, she's made history, and, and we're going to talk about why. Be sure to stay with us during the breaks, where you'll hear from our watch team partners. Carol Egger will be with us for her military watch segment from Comcast NBC Universal. Uh, Madeline Bell will be with us, CEO of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, with a wonderful segment. And Sherry Morrison as well will be with us for her Lifestyle Watch segment. And as always, for more information on the show and to see our uh, wonderful guest lineup, you can visit womentowatch.net, N-E-T. So now I'm very excited and honored to welcome to the show, Alex Allred. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited that we made this uh, just kind of fall into place sooner than we hoped. I know. I had I, That was a great surprise. And I instantly dropped everything because um, I just loved our, our previous conversation. So thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. I, uh, I'm very excited. And, and, and also, look what came in time in the mail. Yay! Your book, which, I love it. which we... Yeah, we will talk about and I, I didn't have time obviously to read all of it because it just came, but I have questions about the stuff in the very oh, beginning of the okay. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's really good. It's really good. But um as always, I want to give our viewers a little bit of information about your background and where you came from. Um, and yours is one that's um truly non-traditional. Uh you were born in Germany and your dad was a US diplomat. And uh, right away, that's, you know, that's kind of exciting. And not only that, you you moved 20 times by the time you were 18, which yeah. is incredible to me. So I, my first question is, tell me what your furthest back memory is of being little um, in, in Germany. And did you recognize that your life was a little bit different from the other kids um, that you were hanging out with? Oh, that's a great question. I've never been asked that before. You know, not initially because we typically lived on army posts or, or in embassies around the world. So it wasn't until um, probably I was in the fourth grade that I lived among civilians. And I remember I actually came home one time and I said to my father, what do you do? And he s explained his title in the, in the army. And I said, yeah, but what do you do? And so he would give me all these covert answers, you know, and I wanted to know, are you a plumber? Are you a lawyer? You know, I just wanted something simple. Yeah. What do you fix? What are yeah. your, yeah. Yeah, your tasks? I, I didn't really understand what my father did probably until I was in uh, middle school. Yeah, I bet. Um, how did he answer that question? Or, or could he really not? You know, he would tell me things like, well, I'm an analyst, and so I like to dig into it. And you're like, I'm, I'm, I'm eight. What do you do? <laughs> what do, you do? <laughs> yeah. Well, I know you were curious, um, something that we shared. And one of the best stories you shared with me in our introductory call was um, you, you describe yourself as a, you know, adrenaline junkie. And it's clear when you look at your, um, your life and, and the journey you took. Um, and you described, you know, uh, racing away from the KGB on a skateboard when you were a kid, um, which you thought was fun. <laughs> tell, tell, tell me a little bit about that story and, you know, what it says about you that you were doing that. 
Well, I don't know that it says a lot of really good things about me, but um, we lived in the Soviet Union and literally everyone, um, you know, I tell people all the time, our, our walls were bugged, our phone was bugged, our maid was KGB. I mean, so even the children, they everyone was followed because in the Soviet Union, every, even a child could be a prospective um, courier. Of, of you know, so wow. Wow. my when I would wake up and and Soviets didn't have skateboards, and so it's 1977, and I've got my skateboard, and I'd go downstairs and go through the tunnel that comes out of our apartment complex, and I would literally stand there and I would look around until I figured out who was trying to not stare back at me. And as soon as I made eye contact with that guy, I was always like, yeah, you're the one. And that's how my morning started. And it was like, yeah. I'm taking off. Yeah. Yeah. My dad used to always tease to say that, you know, he pictured somewhere in a basement and all the KGB agents were getting their assignments for the day. And then finally it would come around and they would go, and Boris, you got the kid. And everybody would go, oh, <laughs> Boris, what a <laughs> So you were, I, you're, you were brave, you know? I, um, I was adventurous, bored. Adventurous. <laughs> you were bored. <laughs> you know, because we didn't have, there was no such thing as um, shopping malls or television or we didn't, you know, we had nothing. And so it was, I read a lot and I tortured the KGB. That, that was my entertainment. Okay. So what was school like? Again, moving pretty much every year. Um, tell me about the school system there at that time. And how you did know, you get acclimated over and over and over again? And we, you and I chatted about this. There's usually with children in, in such families, the child is usually either a complete introvert or like me. And it's funny because my sister is, to this day, it's, she's so incredibly quiet and shy. And I just dragged her into everything I did. So it, I just, that's just how it is. It's, it's either sink or swim. That's how I saw it. And so just going through school, I just would always get out there. She, my sister hid and she was very much into school because of that. And I would go out and be the first one just trying to make the first friend I could make. And, you know, I found out usually if you could make one friend, then you had a connection. And so that's what I was. You asked some of my earlier memories, but I remember I know it was about four and I went trudging into a, a playground full on to go meet my new best friend. Had no idea who it was going to be, but I was going to find her. You were going to find her. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, so what were your aspirations when when you were young? You know, what if someone said to you, what do you want to be when you grow up, Alex? What would you have said? I knew I always wanted to be a writer. And because we moved so much, my father always had us journal. He always wanted us to journal. And um, and mine was a struggle because I have dyslexia. And so mine always became more of a storytelling. And then I would have these fantastic scripts in my head. So I always knew I wanted to be a writer. I don't know, as I got older, I don't know that I thought it was gonna happen. And then it's funny is the thing that got me into the writing world is the bobsledding of all things. Because, you know, I when I go and I talk to authors, um, you know, at different conventions, I always say, and it's always funny when there's men in the audience too, and people will say, well, how did you get started? How do you, how do you get published? And I said, okay, well, first, you got to become a pregnant bobsledder. And then it's easy after that. Because <laughs> okay. I didn't have a lot of competition. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, some of our viewers may not know your story. And, you know, the, the top question is, how did you get involved in bobsledding? I mean, I mean, was that, is that a very popular sport? Was it in, in uh, Russia no. at that time for men? No. Um, it's very popular in a lot of the Scandinavian countries, in Germany. It's becoming pretty popular in, in Russia now. But really, like in the United States, it's not popular. It's really not. And so no. although it's the second, I should, I should clarify, once upon a time, I knew that it was the second most watched winter sport after ice skating. And so um, it's fun to watch because people always like the, the crashing component of it. Having been on the inside, it's not that fun, um, right. but people like to watch that. But I was sitting on the couch. I was watching ESPN. I love sports. And I was sitting on the couch holding my six-month-old baby, and I saw men's bobsledding, and I thought, man, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I couldn't wait for the women to come, and I waited and waited, and they didn't come. And, of course, this was 
before the internet. So I had to go to the library and I looked up and found out that um, Melville Dewey of the Dewey Decimal System, his granddaughter won an open competition, men and women competing in the AAU championships in 1940. And she won. And it took about two days for all the men to decide they did not like that. And so they stripped her of her medals and declared that the sport was too dangerous and banned women from the sport of bobsled. And when I read that, I thought, yeah, no. And so I started a really obnoxious letter campaign to the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, the United States Olympic Committee, the U.S. Bobsled Federation, <laughs> Sports How Illustrated, everybody. Oh, my gosh. How old were you, Alex, at that time? At that time, I was 27 years old. 27 with your yes. first child. Yes. No, I was 28. I was 28 years old. And um, and then I got a phone call a couple months later. And pretty much they said, heavy sigh. We're going to have our first ever women's trials. Are you in big mouth? <laughs> and I said, you better we're believe I am. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, yeah, I'm all in, you know, and then you hang up the phone and go, I have no idea how to bobsled. Oh you know, so. I want to know, you're, you're sitting there, you're watching, you see the sport. <laughs> what motivated you more, the sport, the speed, the excitement of that, or the fact that they didn't want to, they didn't allow women and, and you were going to change that? I just couldn't stand that they were saying that women were not allowed. And at the time, I was also a competitive um, fighter in martial arts, which at that time was there weren't a lot of women doing that. Mm -hmm. And so the idea and I already knew the reaction that I would always get then. You know, you can't do that, especially when I got pregnant. You, you can't do that anymore. You're a mother. And then to find out that women were banned from bobsledding after winning. And since then, by the way, Catherine Dewey, no one else has. Um, ever, no woman has ever won a championship with men and women together. So she stands in the history books. That's why I say, technically, I'm the first U.S. female champion, but I'm really the second. You know, well, and how ironic she proved she yes. proved that women could, and yes. then they just kind of made up. No, you can't. Yep, yep. And that was just that was intolerable to me, and so I just and I my mother. My dainty, feminine, clumsy mother, who also, side note, was responsible for getting a picture of the underbelly of a Soviet tank, would was that was intolerable for her. And so even though she couldn't do the things that I did physically, she would always go, you should do that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. And maybe yeah. she saw something of herself in you. You know, your mom was gutsy. Talk about your mom and your relationship with her. My mom was gutsy. She was an incredible woman. And I'm so proud. She um, passed away several years ago from Alzheimer's. My Both my mother and my father were um, victims of most of the people in the American embassy in the Soviet Union in the seven, 60s and 70s, as it was bombarded with radiation from the Soviets. Mm -hmm. And so many have either succumbed to some form of Alzheimer's, dementia, or cancer. And so both of my parents, that's how they went. But my mom is, she was just the tiniest, most feminine woman. But she, in the, in the 1960s, she would, when the laws were passed in Baltimore, Maryland, making it harder for um, black voters to find the polls, she would drive around and take them to go voting. So she's always been my superhero in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. One time she did some martial arts with me. And I was going easy with her. I thought I was going easy and I was just blocking. That's all I was doing. And she's so, she's so proper. And she grabbed my gi and she pulled me in and she said, if you don't stop hurting me, I'm, I, I was terrified. <laughs> you know, she's this tiny person and I was absolutely terrified of her. And I was, oh my God. Can I get a new partner? Oh yeah. my God. Oh my God. Well, she had it in her, you know, a lot oh, of yeah. times women, you know, appear a certain way. If you dig deeper, there's something else in there. Women are fierce. And that's what I got from this book. When I started researching this book, and I have over 500 women in this book, the one thing, the recurring theme in this book, it didn't matter the sport, the politics, the whatever, women are, are just unstoppable. Women are so amazing. And it's something that I don't think that men really can actually understand because 
they haven't been told they can't do something or it's illegal for them because they're male. Mm -hmm. But it's in all of us. I don't care. Our, even right now, we have, I have, there's girls that are told you can't do blah, blah, because. Hmm. And so we've always, it's just in our nature to fight. I, and that's why I love women so much because I, I'm so proud to be a woman because of our history. Yeah. Alex, I want to go back for um, a minute because you shared with me, you know, very candidly that at 18, you, you suffered a sexual assault. I did. And <clears throat> when I think about that, and um, my first thought is, how did that change you and your outlook? Um, did you become more kind of, you know, closed off, um, or did it put more fight in you? Both, <laughs> it, it, both. It, it, it was it was really difficult. Um, first, I went into denial, and it was really hard. And most recently, I, I read a study that came out of Germany that it takes women about twenty five years to report an assault. And I that really I understood it immediately, and it also made me so sad. And um, I'm so happy now that we live in an era that women are now coming forward. We've got the hashtags believe women. And um, but even then, look, in recent history, we've seen what happens when a woman speaks out. But once I and I kept it a secret for a long time and in martial arts, I didn't go to therapy. I just started punching the you know what out of everybody. And I loved fighting and I I. I'm not proud of that because I know I was too aggressive sometimes, but I actually stopped fighting and I give free self-defense classes now to women. So, and that's one of the things that I talk about. And I, I think I shared with you that only about a decade ago, did I finally come out and say, I know this because this was me. So yeah. it took me a long time to yeah. be able to say those words. Yeah. Really brave, really, really brave to do that. Took me a long time. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's so, I just think it's so helpful for, for other girls and women. And, you know, do you feel as though you, you, you've emotionally been able to, to move past it? So I'll share something that only, I've never told anyone outside my family. Um, so when people meet me and they find out they're genuinely shocked. And now I've tapped into that. And I'll say, why, why, why did that surprise you so much? And they'll say, Cause you're fearless. You you're so strong. You, you know, you beat men and stuff at the gym all the time and you know, you, nothing scares you. And so I always take a moment to go, okay, let me tell you, um, that is true on the outside, but I still have, I, I still have little ticks mm -hmm. and I've never told, but I'll tell you one of my ticks. So I cut my own hair <laughs> because I have an issue with people getting too close to me for too long a period of time even now. And so um, next Monday, I'm going to actually have a professional cut my hair. And, For you know, and it's a, well, the first time in probably eight years and I did it then. And that was only because I cut my, I grew my hair and I cut it for cancer and I butchered it. And I had, and that was kind of traumatic. And before that was probably about a decade. Wow. So it's really hard for me to let people come in close and stay there for a while. Mm -hmm. So this is this is my little thing for myself that next week I'm going to oh, see my heart rate goes up just thinking about going to having someone cut my hair. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I know. wow. It's, a, it's completely nuts. But um, well, listen, thank you for sharing that. You know, we yeah. all have stuff like that. That's yeah. our vulnerability that we don't you, you don't put that out there. Um you don't. I, and so I would ask your viewing audience. So if you ever see me in public and you think, what is going on with her hair? Just know <laughs> that I just, you know, <laughs> you have a great head of hair. <laughs> I have a lot. So, um, you know, my sister said that uh, in the event of a nuclear bombing, the only thing that's going to survive are cockroaches in my hair. So, <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. So I want to tell me about uh, how old were you when you came to the U S um, we were back and forth, but the last time back to stay um, as a family was, I was the, the 14, 15, 15. 
years old. Okay. Okay. And then my parents also were in Tunisia. So I went there in the early nineties and Baghdad. So, but I didn't live there, you know, so I, I by that time I got older and I kind of went back and forth. Yeah. So you've really, you've been around the world and, and in preparation for the book, as you said, you've interviewed hundreds of women. And I was curious if you have noticed was there a glaring um, difference that stood out among women from different places regarding their own level of fearlessness or, or toughness or? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, I think that's one of the reasons now I made my, this is the, the book is mainstream, but it's also toward academia. So I have more American women in the book, but absolutely, you know, we American women have no idea how, great we really actually have it i mean we we are so fortunate which is an ironic statement because what's going on right now um there's a lot of stuff that's hard hitting against women but we really i saw a level of strength and courage and fearlessness around the world that i would i i would come back and i would be so humbled and um, I will tell you even now what's going on with the women in Iran and Afghanistan and in ancient Greece there, they had what was called the uh, controllers of women. And that was a title and they would walk the streets of ancient Greece. And when they saw a woman who wasn't dressed according to code, um, they had permission to strip her of whatever she was wearing and even beat her or rape her, depending on her position as well. And so I think, you know, that's ancient Greece. And then we, you look what happened with the morality police in Iran just recently when a woman was killed for not having her headscarf right. And so, you know, we've come a long way in so many ways, and yet here we are. Isn't and, it? Yeah. Yeah. That's, so just, I want to hold the book up. Yes, thank when, you. When women stood. So on the the woman with the headscarf i yeah. chose her for the story that i just told you and since that book has come out because of the taliban she's gone into hiding the Af the afghan soccer team i mean all the women's sports they were told get off of social media now because death threats were given to them and their families so it's i don't so know where she horrific. is right now it's so horrific that sometimes that you American women, we think, does that really, is that really true? Is that yeah. really happening? Yeah. And it is. And you, you did so much research on the history of women for this book. You know, I when did. you look at it, you think it's a book about women in sports, but you really shared so, how long did it take you? To, it was over to all the information. Well, and, and I have a, an obsessive tendency when it comes to research. So, you know, I tell people, a little over three years with about anywhere from eight to 12 hours a day of reading the, my final product was over 800 pages. And then I, and then I had to just savagely pare it down. And when I did actually have to start editing some women out, I'm not a really emotional person, but I actually cried a few times because I didn't want to let go of some of these women who oh, we've yeah. never heard of. We were right. never taught the history of some of these women. I, I didn't want to let them go because they're just, sometimes I would be reading something and I, my eyes would water up just because I, I wanted to transport through time and just hug her for just being so brave to do what she oh was doing. Gosh. You yeah. know, once it's hard to imagine once upon a time, w men were so opposed to women riding a bicycle that physicians took to writing warnings in the newspapers that if you rode a bike, you could get bicycle face because Yes, the exertion of of riding a bike would give you bicycle face. Oh. <laughs> so all the time now, like when I'm working out, I'll look over at my partner and I'll go, do I have bicycle face right now? <laughs> Whatever that <laughs> is. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, when I started, I, as I said, I, I haven't read the whole book yet, but the first thing that struck me, um, when was this in, in France, um, that it wasn't until... Yeah. Was it wasn't 19? until yeah, very, very, very recently. That women weren't allowed to wear slacks. Yeah. Yes. And and of course women were because it was, you know, I I'm going blank now, but it was two thousand um ugh, I wanna it's in my book, I've gone blank, but it's like something like two thousand ten. It was still on the books that women were not allowed to wear slacks in Paris. Yeah. 
And of course, 2012. 2012. Does that make sense right in France? Yep. And it was not until 1994 that women were allowed to wear pants in on the floor of the U.S. Senate. That's and my college students always are like, what? They can't believe that that's so. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's true. We've come such a long way, but we have such a long way to go in so many ways. Yeah. You know, I think about a lot of topics that, um, and we may have talked about this again on the, you know, things that people have been fighting against for a very, very long time, you know, trying to end war, trying to end racism, trying to get equality for women. And yet here we are. So what does that tell you about humans and, and nature and their tendencies? So, um, there's so many ways to answer that. Um, I'm, this is what I say to my college students when I teach this class in, on campus and online classes. Um, I, you know, I'll say Title IX, for example, and we break down all the myths. You know, no, Title IX does not mean we're taking something from the men to give to the women. That's not what it is. So we break down all the myths. And then in Title IX, it, there are guidelines that if these guidelines are followed, women should not be experiencing or have better protection against violence on campus, right? And then at the end of the semester, I always I'll, I leave a, some open questions to my students. And one of them is, so we've gone through this whole course together. What can we do to stop the hypersexualization and violence and discrimination against women? What can we do? And every semester, I am so disheartened um, to have students, my males and female student athletes, often say nothing. I mean, this is just how it is, and it's too bad mm -hmm. for women because women are pretty cool. I learned in this course, and I always, and so of course, you know, <laughs> I'm always writing back, going no, you know, and giving them everything we talked about. Uh, because, but it just goes to show that even our young folks who are amazing people, they, it's so hardwired in our nature that this is just the lot. This is. This is the lot that women are to take, that, you know, we are to be sexualized and we are to do these things and we are to be burdened. And and they just they we've all kind of accepted it. So in answer to your question, one of the things we need to do is just continuously have more and more men and women stand up and just say, well, that's ridiculous. No, it should be this way. And just argue it instead of just mm -hmm. saying that this is the way it is because yes. it, it should not be that three women every day in this country are killed by an, an, an intimate partner. That is not acceptable. That's a horrible statistic. Right. And I but, think you're so, you're so right about having more men enter this conversation. Oh yes. You can't Absolutely. just be women. Yeah. Um, listen, we have to go into our first break and we'll come back and continue this conversation. Um, stay with us and I'll be back with Alex Allred. We'll be right back. We are CHOP. And we can't wait to show you around. We are the nation's first children's hospital. Now, a care network with more than 50 locations that continues to expand. Three state-of-the-art research buildings with 1.5 million square feet of space. We have grown from 12 beds 165 years ago to nearly 600 beds and one of the best children's hospitals in the world. We have a level one trauma center, 11 floors of patient units, more than 20 operating rooms, first of its kind delivery unit for babies with birth defects, a separate cardiac operative and catheterization suite, and places to learn like our internationally recognized simulation center. We have trained generations of leaders in the field of pediatrics. We are world leaders in medicine, surgery, and science. One of the top recipients in NIH funding for pediatric research. In this building, pioneers in CAR T therapy, mitochondrial disease, brain tumors, hyperinsulinism, and other rare diseases. Here, Groundbreaking work in fetal surgery, genetics and genomics, and neurology. In our newest building, leaders in social determinants of health, clinical informatics and epidemiology, autism, trauma and injury prevention. 
Our patients come from every state and 115 countries. Meeting these challenges requires the best and the brightest. We are passionate about pediatrics. We are motivated to make a difference in the world and in our community. We are a team. We are CHOP. Do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. And the big story on Action News. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hello and welcome back to the show. I'm Sue Rocco and I'm joined this week by Alex Allred. Um, Alex is a national, former national athlete in bobsledding and she's also an author and a teacher. Um, I wanted to kind of continue our talk about the book because I, I think you must have so many insights about the history of women where it started and where we are. And I did ask you just before the break, I guess I was trying to, you know, hopefully hear from you that there has been progression and then you do have hope that at some point with, you know, um, the combination of men and women, excuse me, men and women really coming together to talk about it, that one day there will be the equality that there should be. I. And absolutely, I'm so glad you were coming back to this again because um, absolutely, there are so many there are so many positives. I do believe I'm going to do my Pollyanna routine here, but I do believe that there are far more good men than not, and mm -hmm. I believe that that helps bolster women as well. In my class, a lot of times I'll say, okay, somebody, you know, and I'll ask for a volunteer. And my guys are always the first to jump up and I'll, I'll let one or two come, but then I start picking on my female students. I'll say, you know, why aren't you, why aren't you, why aren't you guys standing up? My, I grew up with my father. It never occurred to me that I couldn't do anything because of my father. My father always let me know that, you know, I could stand, I could stand up. And so I think that's why I, you know, I'll, more times than not, I would say, yeah, I can do something. And then, you know, if I got called on it, I'm like, holy smoke. I was, I was in Target shopping and I got a phone call one day from Volvo headquarters in London. And they called my, and they called me and they said, we've got the Volvo gravity car and we need someone to test drive it. And they knew that I did some other you know, adventure writing stuff. And they said, would you be, if we flew you out to Orange County, California, would you test drive this Volvo car for us? And I was like, sure. Sure. <laughs> I'm sure you said sure. Of and course. So the next thing I know, and it's my 40th birthday, and I am lying on my stomach, stretched out, and I'm about this far off the ground, and the photographer is in at the back of a uh, the bed of a truck following me, but traffic is still going. They didn't shut down the highway because they didn't want Kawasaki, their competitor to see what they were doing for the shoot. They wanted to keep it private. So I'm looking at the underbelly of cars that are passing me and my brakes fail as I'm coming to a T section and intersection. Oh <laughs> and I God. literally had to Fred Flintstone drop my elbows and tore up my leather jacket and my oh, boots coming ouch. to a stop. And after that, of course, everyone was like, I'm so sorry that it was like, and all this stuff. And I remember later on just chuckling and thinking, okay, I never want to do that again, but I'm so glad I did that. <laughs> and so this, but I, my dad hardwired a lot into me that I should always be the first to stand up. Mm -hmm. And so I think as we get more men encouraging women, but also women just believing that they should stand up that we're, it's going to get better and better over time. 
because we, and because they're seeing it right we're we're seeing a lot of firsts yes yes um across all industries and you know it's so true that when they see women doing it yep. of course they think they can in a perfect world I wish that we would stop sexualizing women in every image because I think that's our biggest, I think that is our greatest barrier right now as females is the constant, the constant image that we have of yes. the, what a woman is supposed to look like. And of course, Correct. yeah. Yeah. The physical versus the, you know, the mental uh, capabilities and, and that's, that is so societal and it's so constantly yeah. um, the wrong messaging. That's how I knew that I picked the right sport with bobsledding. So when I lived at the Olympic training center, you go into the cafeteria and they would have little, um, the, the, they would have little cards that showed what sports you were in, what you were allowed to eat, you know, and, and as near as I could tell, like the ice skaters, they were starving to death. I, you know, <laughs> the Nordic ski jumpers. <laughs> and then I would move my tray down and I would see beef stroganoff bobsledders. Oh yeah. And I was like, <laughs> I'm in the right sport. Yeah, this is me. You know, and so it was just, and my teammate, when we went to uh, Winterberg, Germany, um, and it was the, the East Germany, and they were just kind of getting to know Americans. And my teammate, Liz Persmedstadt, who was also another mom, and we're in this hotel, and I'm looking at her, and I'm kind of looking around at some of the smaller women who were bobsledders. And I kept telling Liz, I was like, we got this. You know, we, you and me, we're going to take first place. And then we waited for the elevator to come and we got in the elevator and the, just like a scene out of a movie, a hand catches at the last second and the Swiss team got on. And you know, the elevator kind of went to junk when they got on because <laughs> women were, and I, you know, and we're like, Hey, what's up? You know, and they, they get off and I look at my team. And like, There's nothing wrong with second place. Nothing wrong with second place. And then it happened one more time because when the Germans got on and that elevator really did dip and then got oh off, I was like, you and me, bronze all the way we got bronze, we got bronze. <laughs> oh my gosh well yeah. you, you, you have this sense of belief i think always a belief a, a can-do attitude as opposed to you know you know, like your sister who was more apprehensive and and introverted and you are a mom and i wonder what kind of conversations you're having with your own kids um to prepare them to go out and be believers yeah i'm smiling because Whew, my, they're, they are so opinionated and they are so strong. And I'm, I could not be more proud of all three of my, I have two daughters and a son mm -hmm. and I could not be more proud of all three of them because they, they have great empathy, but they also, um, great awareness and they're so strong it just for themselves, for other people. And, you know, that's, that. That's when we when we start making it our business to stand for ourselves and stand for others without a hesitation on either side. That's when we're, we're going to be where we need to be in the world. Yeah. Um, Alex, I read that you're you're doing a lot of writing and researching in the arena of people with special needs. Yes. What, so tell me about what did that? Yeah, I. In no time in my life did I think this was the direction I was going to go when I was teaching on a different college campus. And I walked off and I saw this group of young adults just sort of walking in a mob. And I just got curious and I walked over to their instructor and I said, so what's, is this a program here? What, what's happening? And she said, oh, it's a new Elevate program here on campus and we're integrating. And I just burst out laughing and I said, I gotta tell you, you're not integrated. You're just a big mob of flesh just moving around. And and I, <laughs> yeah. And at that time I was teaching a kickbox and a Pilates class as well. And so I went to my Dean and I said, can these guys come into my class? And so he said, yes. So I started bringing them in and Oh my word. I just, I fell in love with them. My students fell in love with them and I started learning more. And I found out that at age 21, these same kids who have had public school, the system since they're four years old, you know, a, a schedule friend built in friends, a bus, everything 21, poof, you're out. And mm -hmm. a lot of these families, if they don't have the resources, these young adults literally sit on their couch and just do nothing. So in 2014, I started a program. And if you live anywhere in my, if you can get in a car and get to my gym, 
you're, I give a class for free and I bring these guys in and I've That's been awesome. teaching them. I, I just, it's so important. And so I became an advocate after a while when I started to see all the things that they go through um, in the state of Texas, we're ranked 49th for special education. That's unacceptable. Yeah. And so I just, I'm just always trying to do things for them and bring around about awareness. And I'm actually selling salsa that my guys make right now. <laughs> cool. Oh, yeah. make sure you share that with me. Yeah. Uh, sure. I would yeah. love to send you some. Yeah. There it's, they're just, there's nothing that they can't do. And so right. talk about a can do Whew. these guys, there's nothing they can't do. And they get in my class and a lot of the ones that are new to me, they've been told that they can't their whole life because they have down syndrome or autism or cerebral palsy. And they get into my class and they'll say, well, I can't. And I'll say, I don't care. You're doing it anyway. Yeah. We're in my a class. Way. A, your way, right? A different yeah. way, your way that might be better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, I wish we had more time, Alex. We're actually out of time. We're at the end no. of the show. And um, it's always such a joy to talk to you. And again, um, when women stood, I want people, men and women to go out and get the book. It's great. I can't wait to finish it up. And, yeah. Um, maybe if we'll have got, to men. I say, if you've got a wife, a daughter, a girlfriend, uh, get it for her. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll be staying in touch with you and yes. um, I thanks you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to share. Thank your you. Story. I'm a fan. Great. Great. Mm -hmm. Stay tuned for our lifestyle watch with Sherry Morrison. We'll be right back. Action News, celebrating 50 years of AccuWeather. Over the last five decades, our winters have been getting warmer due to climate change. In Philadelphia, our average winter temperature is up five degrees. And we're breaking more record highs than lows. Thanks for always trusting us to keep you informed. 50 Years of AccuWeather is sponsored by Independence Blue Cross. Choose coverage you can count on with the region's strongest network. From Philadelphia to the Lehigh Valley and everywhere in between, for 150 years, Penn Community Bank has been a part of your neighborhood. Helping businesses start, supporting families as they grow, and staying connected to the people and places that make this region special. It's who we are and where we're from. Penn Community Bank, here we are and here we grow. Go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the stakes and the stakes. Go to get your parlay on. Go to get your party on. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. There's a moment every hour, every day, every week. These moments shape our world. They add color, perspective, and sometimes pain. Moments are meant to be shared. Shared by friends, family, people you trust. At Action News, we cherish every moment. And it's our profound responsibility to bring you closer to your world. Never miss a moment. Trust the people at Action News. Do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. And the big story on Action News. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Welcome to the Lifestyle segment of Women to Watch. I'm Sherry Morrison. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Amanda Owen, author, executive director, and co-founder of the Justice Bell Foundation. Welcome to the show, Amanda. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Oh, we're really happy to have you here. You brought to life a story that I just can't seem to get over. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> I'm going to jump right in because we have a lot to talk about. You've written a couple of books. Mm -hmm. And you co-founded the nonprofit organization called the Justice Bill Foundation. Um, in 2015, you were doing some internet searches because there were some rumors circulating about putting some suffragists on the back of a $10 bill. 
you set out to learn more about that, and you ended up reading a, a small mention of something called the Justice Bell, and that took you in a little bit of a different direction. Please tell us about that path. Yeah, boy, did it take me in a different direction. And in fact, it was, um, uh, there was all of this uh, news that Harriet Tubman was going to be on the front of a $20 bill. We're still waiting. And so there was discussion about some other bills. And it was really when I was kind of Googling that, I thought, let me just learn a little more about this. And it was a very small mention of something called the Justice Bell that was used to promote votes for women, women's, you know, women's suffrage uh, for a Pennsylvania campaign in 1915. And I thought, oh, how odd, I've never heard about this. As it turned out uh, through my kind of deep dive research, this bell, 2000 pound replica of the Liberty Bell, it was called the Women's Liberty Bell or the Justice Bell. It was so famous that news of its travel was Flashed across every headline uh, throughout our nation, um, tons of articles kind of following this bell uh, that was essentially used as a branding tool to kind of bring out crowds to um, uh, get the men interested and, you know, hopefully to vote yes on a referendum that was going to be in the 1915 election in, in um um, in Pennsylvania to vote that women of the state of Pennsylvania could vote. And so I thought this is, you know, such an amazing story, the more I heard about it. And I asked around historians, teachers, librarians, you know, have you ever heard of the justice bell? And everybody said, no, what's the justice bell? And I thought, I can't believe, you know, a hundred years ago, this bell that was so famous kind of an icon of the women's suffrage movement, and now nobody knows about it. And then I was flabbergasted to learn that it was sitting in the rotunda of a bell tower in the middle of Valley Forge Park at a little chapel called the Washington Memorial Chapel. And that was within driving distance of me. And I thought, hmm, well, let me go out and see it. Um, I was a writer, as you mentioned. In fact, I was working on another book at the time. And I drove out to see it. It was this kind of magnificent bell, not a whole lot of information about it. And um, I noticed a books, a kind of a used bookstore on the reverse side of this, you know, uh, bell tower. And so I walked in there and I asked the woman who worked there, I said, do you have any information about the justice bell by any chance? And he said, what bell? And I said, the one about 10 yards from here on the other side of this wall, I said, that huge bronze 2000 pound bell. She said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I, I walked away from that encounter and I thought, I can't find anybody who has heard anything about this. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll write an article. I called my agent at this time. I said, I think I'm, I'm gonna put off this other book. I'm gonna do some research on this kind of new thing I found out about. And um, it seems in no time at all, I ended up co-founding a nonprofit. Uh, the Justice Bell Foundation now brings um, the story of the Justice Bell and the women's suffrage movement uh, to schools and institutions. Ended up making a film about it. So it's really kind of taken over my life. It's kind of, to me, this is a woman's story, kind of put on a pedestal, you know, dragged around the state on the back of a truck and then lapses into obscurity and uh, not uh, celebrated or even really known anymore. So that's kind of become my mission. Yeah, I, I mean, before that even help happened, before it got to the Valley Forge Park in that yes. bell tower, um, Catherine Wentworth Ruschenberger. Ruschenberger, yes. Ruschenberger mm -hmm. commissioned to have the bell made and after it made the rounds in Philadelphia and all, it ended up back at her home um, and then in a field for 50 years. Yeah, I mean, what happened was after this, you know, huge 5,000 mile journey that was like celebrated and reported on um, to all 67 counties of Pennsylvania, um, 
And then it, it actually went to Chicago uh, for a parade. It went to Washington, D.C. I mean, it was really kind of um, you know, people wanted to see this film. It was a, a really big deal. Um, finally, in the Pennsylvania referendum failed. The men of Pennsylvania decided to deny women voting rights. And in fact, at the very same time in New York and Massachusetts and New Jersey also had a referendum. It failed in all four states. And that was really when, uh, you know, kind of women's eyes turned to Washington, D.C., where there was a lot going on to try to get a federal amendment. So that kind of this exhausting slog of state by state by state trying to get women the right to vote. Um, yeah, people thought, you know, let's just really put our energy toward a federal amendment or, you know, this isn't going to happen or it'll take forever. So finally, in 1920, the 19th Amendment was passed and added uh, to the Constitution. Uh, three quarters of the states had to ratify. Tennessee was the last one to ratify um, and oh, by only one vote. <laughs> Um, and it was a 24-year-old state legislator, um, Harry, uh, Harry uh, Burns, whose mother told him uh, to vote for women's suffrage. He actually wasn't going to do it, but he did. And so that's why we have the 19th Amendment. And so in 1920, the justice bell was brought to Independence Square. It was, you know, thousands of people came to the celebration, people from all over the state, um, you know, the mayor made a speech, the governor made a speech, uh, Catherine Wentworth Ruschenberger, who was kind of the custodian of the bell, uh, made a speech, the who's who of the women's suffrage movement, very big deal, front page news. And then there were plans by the women for the justice bell to stay near the Liberty Bell. Um, and by the way, in the celebration, the bell was rung for the first time symbolizing women finally being given the voice, the vote. Uh, so they wanted it in Independence Square to remain there. But the mayor at the time, Mayor Moore, not a fan of women's suffrage, um, he actually had it carted off to a kind of slaughterhouse, warehouse, sheep shearing station, of all things, <laughs> and uh, to be destroyed. Yeah. So Catherine like, went and rescued it, got it out of there. Uh, the men of uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, denied, you know, the the Justice Bell being able to remain uh, there in Philadelphia. And so it, it's like they tried to find, Catherine and the suffragists tried to find a place of national prominence, um, you know, someone to take the bell. Nobody was interested. And finally, this brings us back to Washington Memorial Chapel. Um, there was a Reverend Burke at the time, and he was a great collector of things, and he had a vision of these kind of American history museums, and he collected all kinds of things. Uh, Catherine was not associated with this um, church. It wasn't hers. Um, but he agreed to take the bell with the idea, um, I assume, to put it in one of these, you know, museums that he was going to build. However, he died in 1933 before the bell could be displayed. The bell was left out in the woods there in Valley Forge um, at that for decades. All of the reverends that came in behind uh, Reverend Burke were not interested. And it was not, so this was back in the 1930s. So finally in 1992, kind of the hero of this story, Reverend Richard Lyons Stinson, he was the new rector at Washington Memorial Chapel. His mother had been in the League of Women Voters. He was a history buff. He came upon the bell in the woods, did some research, understood its significance, and had it brought into the bell tower. Um, he was there only till about 1996. Uh, after he left, the bell just kind of fell into obscurity again. There were a couple of things here and there that happened um, to bring some attention to the bell, but the bell was largely ignored. And it was uh, for, de for another uh, few decades. And it was really when um, I looked at this mention of the justice bell in, in 2015, 
and for the last few years have been, um, you know, giving presentations um, and again, you know, film school programs, just wanting to educate um, not only the people of Pennsylvania, but of the nation, all of, about just all of the incredible stories of the women who fought for voting rights, who just ha have extraordinary stories. A film should be made about each of these women. Um, and just, I really wanted to kind of use the bell, which is always fun to talk about a bell, um, uh, to kind of open up this discussion of the fight for voting rights. Yeah, I mean, the the words established justice were engraved on the side of the justice bell. Um, and that was um, to announce the completion of democracy because the Liberty Bell announced the creation of democracy. So it was like completing the goal of democracy. Um, so then you you the bell is in Valley Forge Park. And we're about to celebrate again, and the bell is going to be moved. And this beautiful bell just is not meant to be. What happens next? <laughs> well, what happened was, um, um, you know, actually before 2020, which was the, is the centennial of the 19th Amendment that passed in 1920, uh, there was a lot of kind of work to, um, um, bring attention to the 19th Amendment, to the cause of women getting the vote, but of course then the pandemic happened. But prior to this, uh, through the Justice Bell Foundation, we partnered with the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts to have a replica of the Justice Bell made. So the Justice Bell was a replica of the Liberty Bell. And so we thought, let's make a replica of the Justice Bell so that we can get that on tour to go throughout the state to museums and institutions, schools, historical societies, um, again, as a way to kind of bring attention. So we had that program with the replica Justice Bell start in 2019. In 2020, the Justice Bell at the Washington Memorial Chapel was put on a truck, was not secured properly. It was going to go down to Independence Square, even though we were in the middle of a pandemic, it would be a small audience, but it was still going. Um, but it fell off the truck, kind of rounding the first curve. And so the platform, the carriage, the yoke, uh, um, damaged, uh, well destroyed and uh, the bell damaged. They got the bell down to Independence Square uh, for a small ceremony, um, and then it just disappeared and nobody could figure out where the bell was. I asked around, I mean, literally nobody just could not get information. It wasn't back at the chapel. Um, it took quite a while and some digging, um, but finally learned that the justice bell um, um, there's kind of nothing on the website anymore, nothing about it. Turns out it's in Ohio um, at the Verdon Bell Company. And so don't know when it's coming back to the Washington Memorial Chapel. I'm just so glad that we have our replica bell, um, which right now is in Fort Washington um, uh, at the Upper Dublin Public Library and is due to go to the Del Delaware County Community College and Media on March 21st of this year, 2023, uh, where it will be exhibited for a year. And we will be bringing lots of uh, presentations, the film and stories about the women's suffrage movement to the students and to the public there. That's great. I, I mean, you've, you've created so many wonderful programs. Um, you've written a couple of books, which uh, we mentioned briefly. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, the first of the books was Power of Receiving, a Revolutionary Approach to Giving Yourself the Life You Want and Deserve, and Born to Receive, Seven Powerful Steps Women Can Take Today to Reclaim Their, whole, their Half of the Universe. Um, if you, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm, I'm so sorry we're out of time. Like I, that's why I wanted to get into this quickly because there's so much. Oh, that's, that's, that's quite all right. And we have websites, justicebell.org, amandaowen.com. So certainly people can go to our websites to learn, you know, more about both yeah. the books and our um, nonprofit. So thank you for joining us. For, for more information about Amanda, her books, speaking engagements, go to amandaowen.com. 
For more information on the Justice Bell, where it is on display, speaking engagements, and where you can make monetary donations to keep these programs going, go to justicebell.org. Both of Amanda's books, Born to Receive and The Power of Receiving, are available on Amazon. Yes. Thank you again. Thank um, you so much. Sue will be right back to close out the show. Ladies, keep living your dreams. The faces you know, the team you trust. Action News. Hi, this is Sue Rocco. Women to Watch is pleased to share a clip from Breaking Through, a podcast hosted by Madeline Bell, the president and CEO of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This interview is part of a series in which Madeline interviews chops women scientists about what inspires them and advice they have for other women interested in pursuing science and medicine careers. My guest today is Dr. Susan Firth. In 2021, Dr. Firth was named CHOP's Chief Scientific Officer. She is the first woman in CHOP's 166-year history to hold this important role. I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Firth to Breaking Through. So Sue, it's really great to be talking with you today, and it's a topic that I'm very interested in, which is the future of CHOP and science and research and discoveries. But let me say that you are now our chief scientific officer. So how exciting from that girl with the chemistry set yeah. to the woman who is now the leader of our scientific community here at CHOP. And tell me, you've been in the role now for about six months, and tell me a little bit about what your impressions are, what excites you about the role, and what do you see for the next several years? It's a really exciting place to be and an exciting time in science. Since I've been at CHOP now for about 11 years, and with the talent that we have here, our sense of mission with research as our North Star, I think we have the opportunity to transform the medical care we deliver to children. To hear more of Madeline's interviews with CHOP's amazing doctors and scientists, listen to Breaking Through with Madeline Bell, available wherever you get your podcasts. Do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. And the big story on Action News. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. That's it, everyone, for another week of Women to Watch. Um, next week, I'm going to be joined by Alice Curran. Alice is an attorney and a life science regulatory expert, does a lot of work um, in D.C. Thank you, as always, to Katiri for producing the show and to all of our corporate partners and watch team members. Have a great week, everyone. Now, the Women to Watch, Military Watch. Fewer than half of eligible veterans use the VA health benefits they are entitled to. But those who do use the VA, more than 80% of veterans are satisfied with the VA care. Hi, I'm Carol Eggert, Senior Vice President of Military Affairs at Comcast NBC Universal. Now, you may be asking, why should this matter to me? I share this with you because most of our listeners have some connection to the veterans in their community and may have the opportunity to share information about this new VA benefit. The VA has just launched the PACT Act, which is the Promise to Address Comprehensive Toxics, which is the most significant expansion of veteran benefits and care in more than three decades empowering the VA to help millions of toxic exposed veterans and their survivors. The PACT Act expands VA health care and benefits for veterans exposed to burn pits, Agent Orange, and many other toxic substances. The PACT Act adds to the list of health conditions that the VA presumes are caused by exposure to these substances. This law helps the VA provide generations of veterans and their survivors with the care and benefits they've earned and deserve. The PACT Act is the least we can do for the countless men and women who suffered toxic exposure while serving their country, said President Biden during the PACT Act bill signing ceremony.
It means access to life insurance, home loan insurance, tuition benefits, and help with health care. So, what can you do? Simply refer those veterans you know to va.gov and tell them to search the PACT Act to learn more.